was uh, <laughs> my pleasure. Yes. Uh, Hopefully, it's true. <laughs> yeah. I hope so too. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Robert Seidinger from McGill University, who will. This is what you wanted me to do, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, to give his yeah. short biography as well. Right. <laughs> so. <laughs> Well, he's a very celebrated mathematical physicist that I'm looking forward to hear about uh, leap theory and inequalities of positive density. So welcome to Toronto. I look forward to you. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure. So, uh, yeah, you've heard about the title. I will explain, of course, uh, what these uh, things actually mean. Uh, so let me start by saying that uh, this uh, work I'm talking about is joint work with Rupert Frank, Mathieu Levine, and, uh, and Elliot Lieb, and there is a... There's a short paper in Physical Review Letters which actually explains sort of the physics behind this and the physical consequence and interpretation of these inequalities I'll, I'll, uh, we're going to talk about. And the, the, the detailed mathematics are written up in a longer paper which you can find in the archive if you're interested. So, uh, so uh, I, will, uh, I will start by reminding you, or maybe if you haven't seen it, then explain to you what Lipturing inequalities are. They are, well, uh, uh, well-established and, and often used tool in, in uh, analysis by now, but their origin, their motivation actually comes from physics in particular, from understanding uh, the, the behavior of, of uh, large systems in quantum mechanics, in particular the stability of matter, which is a mathematical problem I will briefly uh, mention actually during this talk. So, uh, so I'll, I'll start by, uh, by uh, explaining uh, leap tiering inequalities, and they concern uh, sort of the discrete spectrum of a Schrodinger operator. Okay, so uh, the operators I'll talk about will always be Schrodinger operators of this kind. There is the Laplacian, okay, or minus the Laplacian, the sum of the second derivatives uh, with respect to a variable x in R d. Right? So, so d in, in in physical applications will always be three, or sometimes maybe two, but actually for here it's really very general. So the Hilbert space is L2, the square integrable functions of a variable x in Rd. Laplacian is, well, the minus Laplacian, the usual Laplacian on Rd, which is in particular an operator uh, uh, that is positive or non-negative, so it has a spectrum <coughs> from zero to infinity. And then you perturb this Laplacian by a local potential, meaning a function, right? A multiplication operator on a uh, on L2, a function V of x, okay? And physically, uh, such an operator describes the motion of a particle in quantum mechanics, where this is sort of, describes the free motion of the particle, and here is a, uh, an external force that acts on the particle, okay? And more precisely, that's the potential whose gradient would be the force, okay? So typically, we think of this being a function that vanishes r rapidly at infinity, and locally it does something, right? Some local bump, and then it vanishes at infinity. And then the Lipterian inequalities concern uh, bounds on the spectrum of this operator, more precisely the negative spectrum. Uh, so uh, for suitable potential of the kind I just mentioned, this linear operator will have a spectrum that consists of a, a <coughs> continuous part from zero to infinity, all the positive energy, so to say it's continuous spectrum physically that corresponds to uh, a particle that is not actually bound by this force, but just sort of moves out to infinity at some given velocity, right? But then there might be negative spectrum, and this would be point spectrum. This would be discrete eigenvalues. They correspond to bound states of the system, right? So think maybe back to quantum mechanics 101. You had like a, this, uh, describing a hydrogen atom, then potential V of x would just be minus 1 over the absolute value of x, and it has a certain discrete eigenvalues corresponding to the bound state of this electron in the hydrogen atom, and then it has positive spectrum, continuous spectrum corresponding to an electron that's not bound to the nucleus. Okay? So concretely, the Lipterian inequalities give bounds on power sums, so sums of powers of all the negative eigenvalues of such an operator in terms of just an appropriate LP norm of the potential. Okay? More precisely, all that enters is the negative part of the potential, which is defined here, right? and I use the convention that the negative part is always positive. Okay? So the potential has a positive part minus a negative part. Okay? So concretely, here are the inequalities. If the lambdas are the negative eigenvalues of H, 
then there is a bound that the sum of the kth, or this is a kappa, I guess, the kappa power of these negative eigenvalues can be bounded by a suitable positive constant times the integral of this negative part of the potential in this operator to a power which happens to be kappa plus d over 2. d is the dimension, right? L2 of R2. Okay? And this constant, of course, doesn't depend on anything. In particular, it doesn't depend on v. Right? This is true for all v, uh, for all potentials, well, when this part is finite, right? otherwise it wouldn't say anything. Okay? Uh, now, this is known to be true or, uh, for suitable values of kappa, and actually <coughs> it's known exactly when such an inequality is true in, gen it's true in general, and that's uh, a bit dependent on the dimension. So in, for one-dimensional Schrodinger operators, this is true if and only if kappa is bigger or equal to one-half. And uh, so the, the, I, I attached some names to this. I mean, the original Lieben-Turing paper, which proved these inequalities, proved this only for kappa bigger than a half, and the endpoint case was proved by Weidel several years later. Uh, in two dimensions, the inequality is true for all positive kappa, actually. Right, but not uh, at kappa equals zero. You see, kappa equals zero corresponds to taking a one every time there is a negative eigenvalue, meaning the left side at kappa equals zero is just <coughs> the number of negative eigenvalues. Right? So you count how many eigenvalues are actually generated, so to say, by this potential V. Okay? And the bound of the number of negative eigenvalues in terms of this appropriate power of the potential is actually also true in dimensions bigger or equal to 3. Okay? And again, Lieber-Turing originally proved it only for kappa positive, but uh, the kappa equals zero case was independently proved by uh, three people, Zwickel, Lieb, and Rosenblum, and is commonly referred to as the CLR bound. Okay? So that bounds the, the uh, number of negative eigenvalues of such a Schrodinger operator. But I kind of assume that higher the kappa is easier to prove this inequality. Um, because the function on the left is smoother in this case. Yes, that's right. And I mean, so, so and actually, uh, you can, if you, uh, well, mm, uh, that, yeah, that, that's true. I mean, it's certainly true that, in particular, going down to the endpoint case required some new ideas, right? So the original Lieb-Turing proof actually did not really care about what kappa was. It wasn't any, diff any more difficult or easier for small kappa. It just broke down as kappa approached the critical value. And for that, new ideas are needed. So in that sense, yes, it was more difficult to small kappa. Okay. So there is actually a nice physical interpretation of this right side. Right? What, what, where does this come from? And that's a via a semi-classical approximation. Okay? So I remind you of that also. So uh, to motivate this, right, think of the following. The left side, the, the sum of the negative eigenvalues to the power of kappa, I can abstractly write as taking the trace of the negative part of the operator, right, minus Laplace and V, the negative part to the power kappa. Okay, that's what it is. The negative part is the spectral projection on all the negative eigenvalues. If you take the trace of the operator to the power kappa, then of course that's nothing but the sum of all the eigenvalues to the power kappa. Okay? So you see it's, a certain, it's the trace of a certain function of this operator. Okay? Now semi-classical approximation means that one sort of associates to every uh, well, there's sort of a, 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 an analog between this quantum mechanical description and an analog description in classical mechanics. Right? So in classical mechanics, one would have a Hamiltonian function where instead of a minus Laplacian, I just have p squared. So I have a function on phase space. I have two variables, x and p. They're both in Rd. Right? And I would write down a Hamiltonian function, which is just p squared plus v of x, <coughs> and one would do Hamiltonian dynamics. And now semi-classical approximation associate sort of a quantum state to every dp dx element so to say in this phase space okay so concretely if you have a if you have the trace of a function of this operator the semi classical approximation would just replace the trace by an integral of a phase space there's an appropriate 2 pi factor in front this is really this is really planck's constant here in our units okay so uh, and uh, so you, instead of taking a trace, you would do an integral of a phase space of the same function of the classical Hamiltonian, which is just p squared plus v of x. OK? 
Okay, so you just do this integral. You integrate this dp dx, the negative part of p squared plus e of x. Okay, and of course you see the p integral you can do explicitly for a given x. This is some number. You can do the p integral, right, which is just going to be an integration over some ball. So you can explicitly work out what it is. You get some power of v. Actually, well, you get power v to the d over two because uh, you have a ball whose radius is sort of the square root of the potential. Right? So you get the ra you get the radius to the power d, so you see that you, the p integral will pick up a v to the power d over 2, and that's what you get. So you see that uh, this integral v to the power kappa plus d over 2 is not really mysterious, it's what, you, what comes out if you do a semi-classical approximation to this quantum mechanics problem. So estimating the spectrum of this operator term, sort of corresponding phase space into Okay. Uh, so, uh, so what the leap Turing inequalities say is that you can estimate this quantum mechanical property, the spectrum of this operator, in terms of the appropriate, uh, uh, the associated uh, semi-classical expression at the expense of maybe a larger constant, right? Here you get some explicit constant which you get by doing this integral. The actual constant in inequality will in general always be bigger, right? or at least not smaller. And it's actually, uh, there's been lots of ongoing research and still ongoing research on trying to find out what these optimal constants in the inequality, in these leap Turing inequalities are, and in particular whether they are equal to the semi-classical expression or not. And this is, some, some things are known, actually it's known that if kappa is sufficiently large, if kappa is big or equal to three halves, then actually this optimal constant in the leap Turing inequality is the same as the semi-classical constant coming out here. But it's also known that kappa is less than one, strictly less than one, and this is not the case. Okay? So somewhere in between, there is a, there's a transition, so to say, between the leap Turing <laughs> constant being equal to the semi-classical one. And one. In one dimension, for instance, it's known that at the end point, the, the sharp constant is one half, whereas the semi-classical one would be one. The physically most interesting case, and, the, and why that is so, I'll, I'll explain, would be kappa equals one in three dimensions, and uh, there, the Lieberthierian conjecture that actually the semi-classical constant is the sharp constant in their inequality, but that's not uh, known. So there, there have been several papers sort of improving the original constant in Lieberthierian, but uh, I think the current sharp value is still a factor. The, the, the current best known constant is still a factor slightly less than two off from the, what is expected. Yeah, so why is kappa one on the case? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. So, so kappa, because one is the one that leap in tiering we're interested in for their application, which is exactly what I explain next. So, and for that, uh, it's useful to, to, to reformulate <laughs> the inequality. So here kappa equals one is sort of special because it has a nice dual formulation, which is, relevant for sort of the interpretation in physics. Uh, so, what, namely, the kappa equals one, which is the sum of the negative eigenvalues, has a dual formulation in terms of a kinetic energy inequality. Okay? So the inequality says the following. Take an operator gamma between zero and one, trace class, okay? So you take a, tr a positive trace class operator that's less than one, and you compute the kinetic energy, which would mean you take, compute the trace of minus Laplacian times this operator gamma, okay? Then there's a lower bound on this in terms of, again, sort of a semi-classical approximation to the this expression, which is a constant, times the integral of the density of this operator to the power one plus two over d, okay? Again, in d dimensions. And the density is just the integral kernel of this operator on the diagonal, okay? So, Physically, this is sort of this is the one what is called the one particle density matrix of a quantum state, and this is the associated one particle density. Okay, so this inequality follows right away from the kappa equals one inequality. Okay, for the kappa equals one Turing inequality, and it's actually equivalent. I mean, it also implies it. Okay, it's just the dual version, sort of taking a Legendre transform with respect to the potential. Alternatively, yet another reformulation sort of in terms of many particle quantum mechanics is to say the following, which is again equivalent to this, namely, uh, if you take a many particle wave function, so psi is now a square integral for a function of n variables, okay? 
okay? And you compute its kinetic energy in quantum mechanics, which is the expected value of the Laplacian for every, for every particle. Right? So you take the Laplacian with respect to xi and sum from i equals 1 to n, and you compute this expression, right? so just the gradient norm of this function, under the assumption that the function is anti-symmetric, meaning anti-symmetric under permutation of these variables. Right? So in physics, this corresponds to describing fermions, which electrons are. Right? So if you describe electrons in quantum mechanics, you have to use anti-symmetric wave functions. Now, anti-symmetric wave functions have the property that if you, if you compute the one particle density matrix, which is sort of the partial trace of this projection onto psi over n minus one <coughs> variables, it satisfies the property that it's between zero and one. So that's where this inequality comes in. So the inequality will say that this kinetic energy is bigger than this constant times the density of psi to the power one plus two over d. Okay. And the density of psi is just what take psi squared and integrate out n minus one variables. Okay. And uh, the usual normalization is you put an n here because this is not the particle density. It's uh, uh, normalized to n, right? the total number. So, so one way to interpret this leap tiering inequality at kappa equals 1, or, or more precisely its dual version as formulated this way, is saying, uh, well, suppose I give you a density of particles, I give you a function rho, a <coughs> non-negative function whose integral is n, say the total number of particles, what is the minimal amount of energy needed to assemble a system of n particles in, at, at this given density? And the inequality tells you that the kinetic energy needed is at least as big as the semi-classical approximation to it. Given the density, you compute integral of the density to the power of 1 plus 2 over d. And that's the, the, that gives you a lower bound on how much energy you would need to get sort of n particles into a configuration with this given density. Uh, it is a sort of uncertainty principle, you could say, because it's, it's, uh, 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 it tells you that if you want it, this density to be very much localized, sort of very peaked, then it, you have to pay a, a big price for that. There's a lot of kinetic energy needed in order to localize the particles into a small volume. Right? That's the consequence of this inequality, and it's a consequence in particular also of the anti-symmetry of this uh, wave function. So if, if, you, if you didn't enforce anti-symmetry, you, you would not get such an inequality, or more precisely, you would get one, but there's some power of n here on the right side. Okay? So the important point is that there is no n here, so to say. All that appears is uh, the density. Okay? Also important applications is that this is sort of linear uh, in the sense that uh, there is an integral and not some power of an integral. So if you had like a density over here and a density over there, the right side is additive. Right? That's also uh, crucial actually in applications. Uh, in particular, the application I have in mind, and that's what Lieb and Turing had in mind, right? I should maybe point out for those of you who don't know, I mean, both Lieb and Turing are physicists, so how did they, how did they end up studying inequalities like, uh, of the, like this? And that was the motivation of trying to understand the stability of matter. Okay? So I will just spend five minutes on this because I, this is really not the point, topic of my talk, but just to motivate where this actually comes from, or wh why it's useful in physics, is to understand what stability of ordinary matter. <coughs> so ordinary matter basically consists of, well, electrons, and nuclei, right, and atoms and molecules, they're all made up of electrons and nuclei. And the question is, why is ordinary matter stable? So if you take more and more junk of matter, why does it not sort of implode? Why does it not uh, uh, clump together? But why is it macroscopic? Why does, so to say, uh, uh, why is it extensive? Why does uh, twice as much matter roughly take up twice as much space? And this is not so clear at all, actually, if you look at the fu fundamental underlying mathematical description of such a system, uh, which is just, well, in quantum mechanics in terms of an appropriate linear operator, the Hamiltonian, right? So specifically, suppose you have n electrons and k nuclei, right? So for simplicity, I think of the nuclei as being somewhere fixed in space. I don't describe their motion, but this could, it, this is just basically to simplify notation. Yeah, uh, well, physically, the nuclei are so much heavier than the electrons that, so that they don't move that much relative to the electrons. So it's really the, the kinetic energy of the electrons is what is important, sort of their motion. 
to understand the stability. Okay, so we have these n electrons, they all are described by just the Laplacian. Right? So you have the Laplacian for every one of these electrons. M is just the particle mass, it's just the parameter in front. And then these electrons interact with each other and interact with this nuclei via some uh, Coulomb potential, right? which I actually explicitly wrote out here. Right? So the electrons repel each other, so there's a 1 over xi minus xj repulsion between the electrons, that's the electrostatic repulsion. The nuclei also repel each other, so the <coughs> nuclear position I call capital R, right? and the electron positions I call x. So this is the repulsion of the nuclei. I assume they have charges called Z. Okay, electron has charge one, or more precisely, it has charge E, which I pulled out in front. Okay, and so this is also with a plus that's also repulsive. The only negative part is while well, the electrons attract to the nucleus, right? So every electron it interacts with every nucleus. So you see, you have sort of n squared negative terms here, right? Because every electron attracts to every nucleus. And now. Uh, what one would like to understand, if one would like to understand the stability of ordinary matter is why is the energy sort of extensive and particularly you would like to prove a lower bound on saying the energy, meaning this, say the infimum of the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, the lowest possible energy state in the system, I also have to minimize over all possible positions of the nuclei because I don't know where they are, right? They will arrange themselves as to minimize the energy then this expression should be linear in the particle number. In particular, there should be a lower bound in terms of a constant, some universal constant, times the number of particles involved. So in this case, this would be n plus k because there are n electrons and k uh, nuclear. Right? So this is what stability of matter refers to. And for this, it's essential that the electrons are fermions. So there's what's called the Pauli exclusion principle, which just means that the wave functions, the Hilbert space this operator acts on, is anti-symmetric functions. Functions that pick up a minus sign under appropriate uh, odd permutations. So they, uh, they are anti-symmetric under permutations of the variables. Right? If, one, if this were not the case, the ability of matter would not hold, actually. But the universe would look very different. So uh, that's what motivated the problem. I can actually more or less give you the proof of this fact because the, the Lieben-Thierry inequality is exactly what one needs to understand the stability of methods a bit more, namely also a certain electrostatic inequality, which I will not prove. But let me actually maybe start with that. It's not very difficult. I could put it on one page, but for lack of time, I'll leave it that way. One can first argue that's basically electrostatic screening, the fact that this total Coulomb potential the interaction of all the electrons with all the nuclei, for a lower bound, I can actually just take the interaction of the electrons to the closest nucleus. So you see, for every, I have here just the sum over n of all the electrons, and I take the interaction to the closest of all the nuclei. Okay? And instead of a z, I have here a 2z plus 1. So there's a certain renormalization going on, but that's not important. So effectively what this is saying is that for, this is a pointwise bound, right? This has nothing to do with quantum mechanics. It's just electrostatics. You have n electrons sitting at positions x1 to xn, and k nuclei at positions r1 to rk, and then it says that the total en electrostatic energy of some future configuration is bounded from below by just uh, taking the interaction of every electron with the closest nucleus. Okay. Now once you know that, once you believe that, leap Turing inequality gives you the stability of matter. The leap Turing inequality says, right, that in general, if you have a potential, and if you look at such an operator, right, for F, you have n particles, and each one of them interacts with some given external potential, then for a lower bound, you can, well, for a lower bound, you can say this is at least, this can not be any smaller than the sum of all the negative eigenvalues of this operator, minus Laplace and plus V. That comes from the anti-symmetry of the wave functions, which effectively says that you have to fill up the energy levels. That's where the sum of the lowest energy levels come in. You can only put one particle in every level because of anti-symmetry. Okay? So you can bound this by the sum of all the negative eigenvalues of such an operator, and uh, according to the inequality <coughs> I explained, this is bounded by this, the potential to the appropriate power. Okay? And now you just do this with the potential you get here from the right side. Okay? You have to sort of shift it by, by, by a suitable constant because it decays too slow at infinity, but you just plug this in, and that gives you stability. Okay. Basically, from, that from these two inequalities, if you sit down and work it out, that's, uh, you, you get the result. 
So I should say this is basically the proof, not quite actually, but I guess at least morally, this is, based, this is the proof of stability of matter given by Lieb and Thierry in 1975 using their inequalities. The first proof of this fact actually goes back to a famous paper by Dyson and Lenard several years earlier, uh, whose, whose proof was actually much more complicated and much longer, basically because they didn't have these nice tools, uh, these inequalities available. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll end the discussion of stability of matter here. This was just sort of a, I guess, general education and just a motivation, uh, and also his history where these inequalities come from. If you're interested in this subject, I can do a little uh, commercial for the book I wrote uh, with, uh, with Elliot, uh, came out two years ago, on the stability of matter problem in quantum mechanics, where uh, these things are, are explained in detail, and also various other models of various complications are, are treated. So now I, I want to come to the actual topic of my talk, namely uh, a generalization of these inequalities to uh, positive density. So, so the physical situation I want to describe is, is as follows. Suppose you have actually a macroscopic system, say an electron gas or something, right? So you have, you have already a macroscopic system at equilibrium. Right? So say it has some given density, some given temperature, which could be zero for now for simplicity. <coughs> okay? And now I want to ask the question, suppose I change the density locally a little bit. Okay? I, I make some bump or I make a little hole or something. How much energy do I have to pay to do that? Okay? So it's the exact anal analog of what I had asked before, but before it was sort of a vacuum. Right? Before I told you one way to interpret the Lipturing inequalities is how much energy does it cost to sort of create a certain density profiles of electron? But that was all, always sort of compared to the vacuum. Initially, there was nothing. I put in n particles at a certain density profile and I ask how much energy does it cost? Now I want to be more general. I want to say, suppose initially there was not a vacuum, but there was already a macroscopic system, a gas at a given density. And then I ask, suppose I change this density locally a little bit, uh, how much energy does that cost? Uh, and again, I wanna, the, the, the answer will be one can estimate this energy cost in terms of the semi-classical approximation. Okay. So I'll, I'll explain that. Okay. So we imagine we have an infinite system because I have a macroscopic system. I don't want to worry about boundary conditions and things like that. So I just take an infinite system. Okay. Uh, an infinite system of non-interacting fermions. So I just sort of fill up energy uh, levels at some given density rho. Okay. So the mathematical description of this, or I guess more precisely the one particle density matrix of such a state, is just the projection of uh, the spectral projection corresponding to the Laplacian being less or equal to some level mu. Okay? So this, the, right, the, the Laplacian has a spectrum that runs from zero to infinity, and I sort of fill up all the energy levels up to some level mu. Right? So I take the spectral projection corresponding to the minus Laplacian being less or equal to me. Okay? And the you're, mu in, you're in the box somewhere. No, I don't. I, I do this right away in infinite space. Okay? So, so that's what I said. I don't want to worry about boundary conditions. I okay. do this right away in infinite space. Okay? Okay, so the Laplacian is purely continuous spectrum. Right? So, so, but still, this is perfectly well-defined projection on this window of spectrum between zero and... No, the trace class. No, no, it's certainly not trace class. It's only continuous spectrum. Okay? And the mu is just as a one-to-one -one uh, correspondence between the mu and the rho, right? rho being the actual density of the system. So if you do the computation, uh, mu happens to be rho to the 2 over d. Again, I can do this in d dimensions, d equals 3 in applications. Okay? So this is just a simple calculation you can do in, well, that's the volume of a ball, basically. Okay? okay, so this state sort of describes my infinite... Uh, my, my infinite system of, 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 of my, my Fermi gas, and now I want to make a little perturbation, right? So I'm, now I'm thinking of actually saying my actual state of the system is again described by a density matrix gamma, so an operator between zero and one. Right? Will not be trace class, okay? But rather I'm thinking of this as being a small perturbation of that one, okay? So I want to compute the trace of minus Laplacian minus mu, right? So mu being a positive number of gamma minus this guy, right? So what is the idea here? Formally, this guy 
is what minimizes this expression, right? If you, if you minimize this thing of all gamma, of course you get minus infinity, but formally the minimizer is while well, you take the projection onto the negative spectrum of this guy, which is this guy, okay? So this is all a bit formal, right? But the difference, I mean, the difference makes, if I assume that gamma minus this pi is some nice, if you want, finite rank thing or whatever, this makes perfect sense. And in particular, you can convince yourself it's a non-negative expression. The reason is formally this guy is what minimizes this expression. Okay? So I take this minus its minimum. Okay? So you get positive expression. And this is sort of the energy. It's a bit, I mean, it's energy and also I subtract this mu such that this is always non-negative. Right? This is sort of the energy cost uh, for changing the state a little bit from this pi to the gamma. Okay? So the rho here is the rho is just the constant. That's the constant background density that I want to change a little bit. That's right. So the the uh, so I'm thinking the density of this gamma will basically be rho, except locally it will change a little. Okay. Asymptotically at infinity it will be rho. Okay. What I want to compare this with is the semi-classical approximation, which you can just easily write down, right? Namely, well we know what the semi-classical approximation of the kinetic energy of this gamma is it's just the associated density to the power 1 plus 2 over d, and you integrate over all space. Okay? The same thing here, but here the density is just the constant. That's the constant background <coughs> density rho, I subtract. And then I still have the term with the mu here. Now, if I plug in what mu was, actually, you see it comes out this way. So uh, you, get, you get, again, a rho gamma, you get a rho gamma minus rho with an appropriate coefficient. So this is uh, the semi-classical approximation to this expression. Okay? And you can actually see that this, this integrand here is positive. Okay? But just by noting that this is a convex function of rho. Okay? So this is, you evaluate it here at rho, rho gamma of x, here at rho, and here is exactly the slope, this is exactly the derivative. Uh, so it's just, uh, it's just you know, subtracting the tangent. So, so because it's a convex function, this is actually pointwise non-negative. Okay? And you see it's well defined, it's finite even only if this rho gamma, or it has only a chance of being finite if this rho gamma asymptotically goes to rho, right? Because that's where this guy vanishes, if rho gamma is equal to rho. So I'm thinking now rho gamma being close to rho, asymptotically it's rho, locally I change it a little bit, and I want to know, is this, at least in terms of a lower bound, uh, a, a good approximation to the actual energy of uh, the actual quantum mechanical energy. Okay. So as I said, the integrand here is not negative. If rho gamma is close to rho, it, it, it vanishes quadratically. And asymptotically for large rho, it grows like this rho to the 1 plus 2 over d that we've already seen. So the... Uh, the, the, the main result is that indeed this holds true, okay? So the main theorem says that uh, indeed, if you take any such gamma, I mean any of course always meaning that this be finite, otherwise the inequality wouldn't say anything. So you take any such gamma, any perturbation of this projection uh, of the Laplacian up to levels mu, you take any perturbation of that, then you can always f get a lower bound of this in terms of the corresponding semi-classical expression with a suitable constant, right? The constant will in general be lower than what the semi-classical approximation predicts, but it's some universal constant which we have an estimate for. Okay? So no matter what uh, uh, the state is, you can bound this in terms of the semi-classic approximation. So as I said, the physical interpretation is sort of, you give yourself a rho gamma that's a small sort of local perturbation of this rho, and you ask uh, what is the minimal kinetic energy needed to, 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 to arrange the system at such a density, and the answer is uh, up to a constant, it's the semi-classical approximation. <coughs> So, in particular, note that this really generalizes the Lipterian inequality, more precisely the, the particular one corresponding to kappa equals 1, which is just reproduced if you said rho equals 0. Right? If, you, if you said rho equals 0, then these terms vanish, and of course this pi mu will just be 0. Mu is actually 0, and this just reduces to the usual Lipterian inequality. Um, 
by a simple scaling argument, you can actually also convince yourself that the constant is independent of rho. So, uh, 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 well, physically, just because left and right sides scale in the same way and the, ch and the appropriate lengths rescaling. So, so, the, so k is dimensionless, so it cannot depend on rho. Uh, one thing I should also point out, right, d big or equal to 2. So, interestingly, at, at first sight, maybe surprisingly, such an inequality does not hold in one dimension. Okay? The, the, zero, the zero density version, the usual Lipschitz inequality, does hold, as I mentioned, but this version, the positive density version, fails in one dimension. Okay? And this has actually something to do with, act, with, an, with actual physical uh, effect known as the, the piles instability, and you can see this by doing second order perturbation theory. Okay? I actually have this on my next slide. So this inequality only holds true in dimension big or equal to two. <coughs> and as I said, the physical interpretation is it quantifies the energy cost to make a local deformation in the density, right? Which could be both positive or negative, right? You can either sort of increase the density locally a little bit or you, you, you decrease it. Okay. So, now there is also a more uh, sort of maybe spectral theoretic interpretation of this by just going to the dual version, but right? that's the one I started out with in my, in my first transparency, having a Laplacian plus a potential, right? having a Schrodinger operator. What is the interpretation in terms of spectral information on the Schrodinger operator? For that we just look at the dual formulation, we take a Legendre transform. Okay? So a Legendre transform with respect to rho now, and if you do that, the theorem uh, becomes the following statement, namely, you, you take any, you take an arbitrary v, while well, arbitrary, of course, assume the, the case fast enough, actually, the theorem will hold whenever v is in L2 and in L1 to the 1 plus d over 2. Okay? But just think of some, having some nice potential that decays fast enough, okay? So now we're looking at the Laplacian plus the potential, but now we're, we're not looking at the negative eigenvalues, right? We're actually looking all the way into the continuous spectrum, okay? So, the, right, so it's always useful to keep in mind if I plot the spectrum of minus Laplacian plus V, but here is zero, there's always continuous spectrum here, and then there might be some negative eigenvalues. The leap tiering inequality is concerned only these negative eigenvalues. What our generalization does is we look actually up to here. We look at this whole spectrum here, okay? And we look how it changes, how it depends on V. So both the negative eigenvalues and the continuous part of the spectrum. Okay? So we look at actually, so we take the operator minus Laplacian plus V and we look at it at um, energies less or equal to mu. Right? Which is just saying I take minus Laplacian minus mu plus V and take its negative part. Okay? The trace of that, this is of course not trace class because this contains all the continuous spectrum. But let's subtract the <coughs> corresponding one without the v, the unperturbed one, and actually hope that this is trace class. Actually, it's not, it's not actually trace class, so this is a bit formal, but there's a natural way to define this trace anyway. Uh, and uh, so these are some technical details I, I'll skip here. So this difference has finite energy, so to say, I mean, this trace makes sense if you suitably define it. Uh, it Actually, if you do the Legendre transform, you also see there's another term popping out, which is sort of nat the natural one. Namely, this is like the first order pertur perturbation term, right? If you expand this formally in powers of V, then the first order term is just V integrated against the density of the unperturbed term, which is exactly rho. So it's just rho times integral of V. Okay? So that comes out. And then the, <coughs> you get the lower bound of this expression in terms of a corresponding uh, semi-classical expression, so it's just an integral of a certain function of v. So you get v minus mu negative part, mu the power, and there's a linear term here. Okay? So if you look at this integrand here, you see that it behaves quadratically for small v, uh, uh, right, because you see, if you, if you expand this in v, you get this term as the zeroth term, here is the first order term, so it be behaves quadratically for small v, and then it behaves like v to the power 1 plus d over 2 for large v. So it gives a bound on the difference of the spectrum, so to say in the sense of the operator uh, with and without v, but now not just counting the negative part, but extending it all the way up 
to into the continuous spectrum. So it's so 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 the I guess suitable mathematical interpretation of our new Lipterian inequalities is sort of Lipterian inequalities concerning not only the discrete part of the spectrum but also the continuous <coughs> part of the spectrum. So you regularize this by zeta function or what's there are the trace? When you say you have to regularize the trace to define. Oh, uh, well, okay, I guess the, 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 the slop, sloppy way of saying this would be you have to evaluate the trace in the basis given by the Laplacian. That makes sense. That's a well-defined expression. But actually, that's not how we define it. So, so uh, the, the, uh, maybe, I, maybe I can actually say it down here. So what the left side really is, this is a bit formal, right? Because this will in general not be traced because actually I also don't even want to assume that V is L1. I don't have to assume that. What the left side really is, is the following thing. You take, so, so this negative part is of course just minus Laplacian minus mu plus V times the projection onto where minus Laplacian plus V is less or equal to mu. Okay? And now you subtract the one without the V. So you see that includes sort of the linear term here that I formally uh, expanded out. Uh, now this guy here is still not trace class in general, right? but uh, but you can define it simply by noting the noting the following. This operator here, you see, is the difference between two projections. Okay, where this guy is negative, this thing is one, so this operator is positive. Okay, right? yeah, where this guy is positive, this operator is zero, so this guy is negative. Okay. So you can split it into two terms. You, you define the trace by saying, uh, I take first only the, ne the positive part of this guy, where this operator is negative. Right? So you actually put the square root of this guy on the other side for this term, and then you have a well-defined expression because you have a trace of a positive operator. And for the other guy, where this is negative, this guy is positive, and up to a sign, you again put the square root on the other side, and you have a well-defined expression. So this is really defined as a sum of two terms, which are both positive then and well defined. And that's the proper definition. I, I, I can write it out. Too. So there's a natural way of making sense of this, even though this in general is not expected to be trace class. So this trace here has to be appropriately defined. So, uh, so, so as I said, it gives a bound on sort of the spectrum of the Laplacian all the way to the continuous spectrum. And in some sense, one can also say it, 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 it is an estimate on the validity of first order perturbation theory because, as I said formally, this is the first order result if you expand this in powers of V and sort of uh, what it estimates is how good, what, what is sort of higher order corrections. All higher order corrections are sort of estimated in terms of uh, the semi classical expression. As I said, for small v, this behaves like v squared. Right? So, there's a v there, so, so all the terms beyond first order are sort of estimated. So this is really an equivalent inequality just obtained by the Jacques transfer. Okay. Uh, here I wanted to briefly comment on the fact why one dimension such inequalities are not true, and that can be seen by first order perturbation theory, uh, or second order perturbation theory, by which I mean the following. Take the left side that we just had, right? sort of the, the, this trace of the negative part of the operator with or without the V, and not replace V by t times v, where t is a small parameter, and look at the asymptotic for small t. So this is just perturbation theory. So the first order vanishes, and you, you get a second order term. Okay? So that's why you have to divide by t squared, and then you can actually compute the limit. At least, say, if v is nice enough, you can assume whatever you want. You can compute this limit, and it's quadratic in v, and it has this explicit expression in terms of the Fourier transform of v. So it's some explicit function, psi, uh, multiplied by the square of the Fourier transform. Okay. So now you just look at what Psi is. Well, if you remember quantum mechanics 101, second order perturbation theory, you sort of have an energy denominator, which is a difference of the energies between sort of the, the original state and the, the, the state you get into after perturbation. So specifically, you started with the Fermi C, so all the P's run in a ball less than one, and then afterwards you end up in a state with energy bigger than one. Okay. I have rescaled everything by mu, so my, my mu became one effectively. Okay, so p runs over a ball less than one, and p minus k runs over a ball bigger than one, 
is always bigger than one, and you do this integral, okay? Which you can actually compute. It's a, it's a, it's a nice uh, little exercise in computing this, but that's not the point. The point is that in one dimension, you can easily see that this, this function is not bounded, okay? So this function has a logarithmic divergence at k equals two, okay? And so if psi is not bounded, that means that you cannot, ex you cannot ex uh, bound this guy in terms of the integral of the square of the potential. Okay? But the semi-classical approximation, the second order term is just the integral square, of the, the, the square, sorry, the integral of the square of the potential. Okay? So it can't possibly be correct if this psi is not bounded. Okay? And in one dimension, this psi is not bounded. Okay? So you can construct a counterexample to the previous inequality by taking a v that is sort of very singular exactly at k equals, at k squared equals mu, exactly at the Fermi surface, such that psi is in, v is in L2, but this integral is in V. Okay? So that gives, the, that gives you a counterexample in one dimension. In higher dimensions, this function is, however, nicely bounded. It's actually a decreasing function, or at least non-increasing function, and therefore there is no contradiction, and actually the inequality does hold in higher dimensions, as, as I just said. All right, so now, I don't know, I have probably like five minutes left. I don't know when we started. It's five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, okay, so I have actually more or less the complete proof of this theorem on my slides, because it is surprisingly simple. It's, at the end, I mean, it took us a long time to figure out, but at the end, the proof is much, much simpler than the original proof of lip theory, even though the result is much more general. So still, I will probably not be able to go through it in five minutes, so let me just give you one idea, and that has to do with a new method to obtain also the original lip Turing inequalities in a very, very simple way, using basically nothing but a triangle inequality, okay? And this is a, a method that was recently, last year, I think, invented by Roumer, which I want to briefly explain, okay? So, first of all, let me say the following. The right side of our inequality, the semi-classical approximation, is convex in the density, okay? So therefore, I can sort of split it for free into two pieces. So meaning I can split the density into four different pieces in the following way. So, so my object of interest is always this difference in the state, right? So I start with the unperturbed state, I perturb it a little. So the difference I call Q, okay? That's sort of the small thing in a sense, okay? And I split it into what happens uh, below, below mu, right? so below the Fermi C and above, right? and there are off-diagonal terms. So here I take the part that's projected onto energies less or equal to mu, here is the opposite one, and then there are off-diagonal terms. And of course there are the associated densities of these operators. Okay? And what I'm saying is that I can prove the inequality sort of individually for all three terms because of this convexity. Okay? That, that will be uh, enough. Now, to be precise, the kinetic energy, what I have on the left side of inequality, doesn't depend on the off-diagonal terms at all, right? It's just, uh, well, because this guy, I mean, pi commutes with minus Laplace. Minus, right? So this is actually just the sum of the terms inside and outside, okay? And I look at those separately, okay? And the point is that brings me back to what I just said. I mean, that's sort of already basically how these things are defined appropriately, right? Namely, uh, for the Q++, the Q++ is positive, and uh, this guy is then negative, so this is always, I mean, maybe I screwed up the sign here, actually, I think it's minus this, right? Because Q++ is positive, and this is negative. Sorry, there's a, there's, there's a minus sign. But anyway, I can express it in terms of the trace of a product of two positive operators. That's why this sort of also perfectly well defined. And the same thing for minus minus, okay? So at the end, you see, I have some effective operator here. That's what it is. And I have to compute the trace against the absolute value of minus Laplacian minus mu, okay? So effectively, I want the lip Turing inequality sort of where the Laplacian is replaced by the absolute value of minus Laplacian minus mu, okay? And a nice way of doing this is this recent method by Rumer, which works basically for any functions of the Laplacian. Right? And it goes as follows. So right, we have this guy, we we'll take the trace of minus Laplacian minus mu absolute value against some operator, okay? So take the following observation. For any operator, it's true that the operator I can write, right, 
So for any operator A, it's true that I can write it as an integral DE of the projection, I just think I call this one, but corresponding to A big or equal to E. Okay, this is true for any now, journal. Okay, it just corresponds to writing the identity function on the left side as sort of as a sum of step functions like this. The sum being really continuous. Okay? So I start with that observation. <coughs> so this way I can write this as an integral over energies, right? And then I have the trace of the operator Q, which is just saying I have to sandwich it with the projection of this guy being big or equal to E, this operator. Okay? And now I'm just saying that the trace of an operator is the same as the integral of the density of the operator, so integrating over the diagonal, and I use Fubini to interchange the two integrals, so I have an integral over space, and then I have an integral over these energies of the associated density, which is the di diagonal of this operator. Okay? And now comes the triangle inequality, okay? which says the following, that the density of this operator Okay, of, of the original operator, I can bound in terms of the density of the term with the projections here and the density of the guy with one minus projections on both sides. Okay, so this is just, well, saying that the distance between two points, I can bound it by taking the distance in that direction, sort of projected in this way and projected in the orthogonal direction. Okay, so it's the triangle inequality. And now, in addition, I use that this operator is q is less than 1, right? I have to use somewhere the property that the state is between 0 and 1. So this is less than 1, so therefore, I can actually drop, right? So here, it was really the operator with 1 minus p's on both sides, but I can just drop the q bounded by 1. So, so r of e is just the density of 1 minus p, right? which is the projection onto minus Laplacian minus mu being less or equal to e. So I can explicitly calculate it. Okay, it's just the difference of two balls, integral of two balls, so here's what it is. Okay? So therefore, I get a nice inequality because, you see, I wanted the lower bound on that thing. Move this to the other side, take the positive part, so this is saying that you have a lower bound in terms of the original density right, minus this guy, an explicit function of E, and you can take the positive part. Okay? And then you integrate the E. So the inequality we've just proved is that this is bounded from below by a certain function of the density, right? and the function happens to be given by this integral. Okay? And this integral is more or less exactly the one we want, the semi-classical function. More precisely, it's a function that vanishes quadratically for small arguments, and it goes asymptotically exactly like the, the right power. Okay? So that takes care of sort of the diagonal parts of the density, and gives exactly something we want. That still leaves the problem with these off-diagonal terms here, right? The ones where I have a projection left and a projection right. And you see, they actually don't contribute to the energy at all, right? They don't show up on the left side of my inequality. So that looks funny. And I want it on the right side. It doesn't show up on the left side. But of course, there's a constraint. But right? these are not independent of those guys. They are constrained by the fact that Q is the difference of two operators that's between 0 and 1. Right? So Q is between minus 1 and 1. Okay? So these constraints you can use uh, to uh, prove an inequality, and I just display it and, and not give you the proof, although it's also on one slide. It uses a Schwartz inequality. Okay? So all I'm using is a triangle inequality and a Schwartz inequality. And the Schwartz inequality obtained in a suitable Applied in a suitable way tells you that you can bound the off-diagonal parts of this density in terms of the kinetic energy, okay? in terms of the full, en uh, the full energy involving all the, the diagonal parts of this operator Q. Okay? There's actually a function involved here which looks, which looks almost like this second order perturbation theory function I had before, except that it's not sort of the difference of the energies, but it's the product of the square root. So it, it differs by sort of a little arithmetic geometric inequality from it, okay? But th this function phi is again the property that it's bounded in dimension big or equal to two and it's not in one dimension, okay? So this tells us that also the off-diagonal part, its L2 norm can be bounded by the kinetic energy and in particular, you see, I can think of this as being my, uh, the appropriate function of the density which should behave quadratically for small density, but only lower order anyway for, for, for high density. So in particular, this one was good enough. Okay. So this basically concludes the proof. 
uh, modular technical details, but it's really quite simple at the end. Okay, so I conclude. Uh, what I've shown to you is sort of a positive density analog of the well-known leap theory inequalities. It, the, the physical interpretation is that you are bound, you give a lower bound on the minimal energy cost to perturb an infinite system of electrons, or say a free Fermi gas, uh, perturb this density locally a little bit, and you get a lower bound in terms of the semi-classical approximation corresponding to this yeah, energy change. Okay? Mathematically speaking, we sort of control the behavior of the spectrum of minus Laplacian plus V, but not only the discrete spectrum as in the usual Lipterian inequalities, but also uh, the continuous spectrum. There are various generalizations of this, right? One I had briefly mentioned from a physical point of view. You can also look at, the, you can also start with a system not just at a given density and zero temperature, but you could start at some given positive temperature and you get the same result. Effectively, what you're doing is not just computing different functions of this operator, right? Here, here I took the negative part of minus Laplacian plus V minus mu, right? but I could take other functions of this operator. So instead of the sharp cutoff, if you have a that's right. So instead of a sharp cutoff, you would have some smooth cutoff, but that's exactly what you get when you write down the Fermi Dirac distribution. So you get a different, again, convex function of this operator, and you compare it with or without the V. And our inequality will give you a bound on this exactly in terms of what you would get from the semi classical approximation. So this works for very general, I think, basically arbitrary convex functions, because any convex function you can always write as a, as a, combination of these elementary ones that sort of take the ones you consider the negative part. Okay. There are various, gen various other generalizations, one of which one could imagine be a physical relevance also, is that you don't start with a translation invariant system, but say with a periodic system. So you have, uh, you have electrons in a crystal, right? Uh, so you have a periodic background potential. You, 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 you uh, start with a system at a given temperature and or density, uh, sorry, given density, I want to say, and or even positive temperature, and then you perturb it a little bit. And actually, the same method works. Okay, So you can think of perturbations of various other systems as long as you know enough about the unperturbed system so that you can do all this analysis, uh, you get uh, an appropriate one. So I'll stop here. Are there any questions or comments? Actually, I want to ask about the, uh, about inhomogeneous in the uh, initial distribution. So it must it must be periodic, or it can be arbitrary, say potential, and and you know equilibrium <coughs> distribution. Yes. So it can be arbitrary in the sense we have sort of an abstract inequality that says you start with some abstract background operator and you perturb it. But you have to know something about the background operator. As long as you can give me information, say, on the density of states and things like that, then the method will apply. So there, periodic is, is merely one example. But uh, there's, a, there's really an abstract theorem behind this which says take a very general Hamiltonian and you perturb it locally. But the periodicity is periodicity in V, right? Not in mu, for example. No, no, that, that would be exactly mu. So effectively, I'm thinking, suppose the mu were not constant, but would be a periodic potential, right? That's exactly what I have in mind. So you take this, you take a system with a periodic background, and then you perturb it locally. So you change the potential, you add a V, a local potential, then you ask how much will the energy change. But the periodic potential doesn't really have to be periodic. You could think of various other scenarios. Yeah? Any other questions or comments? So I have one question. What happens if you have a magnetic field in this circumstance? So there are magnetic lead theory inequalities. That's right. Generalizing the classical case, but in this positive density case, is that something for the future? Uh, yes, uh, it is. We briefly thought about it, but actually we don't know how to prove it with magnetic field. And the reason is that this very nice method by Roumer I mentioned which is so extremely elegant and reduces the Lipterian inequality to a triangle inequality does not work with magnetic field. Or at least, it's not obvious how to uh, how to extend it to magnetic field. Let me think. Uh, let me know what I'm saying. No, actually, let me. I have to briefly think about this because now I don't see.
No, this may be wrong. I think I'm confusing this with something else. I think this might actually work, right? Because the point is, the, you don't have to know much about this operator. All, the, the only place where the, the details of this operator actually entered was in computing the density of the projection onto energies less or equal to E. So if you know something about that, I think you'll get the same result. So actually, now I don't remember why we thought it didn't work in the magnetic fields, actually. But the fact that it's, it's a real operator does not play a new role. No, I don't think so. I don't see it now. Although I vaguely remember that we discussed it and we realized there was a problem, but now I don't see it anymore. So, so. if you have a spin, for example, and coupling to a spin, Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that. So maybe spin in general, I haven't discussed spin because I wanted to keep it simple, but you can, of course, include spin here and, and, and it works the same way. But you're talking about an operator that actually couples to the spin, right? And th then I, I don't know. Well, let's thank Robert for showing us the power of Cauchy Schwartz inequality and the triangle inequality <laughs> with you in the right way. No integration by parts. There was no integration by parts. Or it's hidden somewhere in the train. <laughs>